Hello and welcome to this special episode of Diplomata. I'm Francis Sune. The final fight for independence of the Timorese would have been much harder or even impossible without the active role of the United Nations. The referendum on the 30th of August 1999 was the culmination and the end of that 24-year-long struggle for freedom. It came with a very expensive price. However, the Timorese were so determined to get what they had been wanting for so long. The popular consultation itself was the result of so much hard work of the United Nations mission in East Timor, mostly known as UNAMED. The leader of that mission was British renowned human rights activist Ian Martin. For the period of UNAMED, Ian served as the UN Secretary General, the late Kofi Annan's special envoy. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to sit down with Ian to talk about his experience in Timor back in 1999 and also his life and his work as a UN diplomat. Ian Martin is an English human rights activist and advisor and sometime United Nations official. Martin was educated at Brentwood School in Brentwood, Essex and graduated from Emmanuel College, Cambridge with first class honors in history and economics. Afterwards, he was a graduate student in development economics at Harvard University for a year. In 2003, he was given an honorary doctorate by the University of Essex. His most recent UN assignment was as the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of United Nations Support Mission in Libya. From 1969 to 1972, Martin worked for the Ford Foundation in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. In 1971, while in Dhaka, East Pakistan, he witnessed the beginning of Bangladesh's War of Independence. He was a Labour Party councillor in the London Borough of Redbridge in 1978 to 1982. And in 1985, he was the head of Asia region in the research department of Amnesty International. He also held the position as Secretary General of Amnesty International from 1986 to 1992. While in Rwanda, Martin was named Chief of United Nations Human Rights Field Operation from 1995 to 1996. During the United Nations mission in East Timor that garnered worldwide attention in 1999, Martin served as the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for the East Timor Popular Consultation. From 2000 to 2001, he was appointed Deputy Special Representative of the UN Secretary General in the United Nations mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea. In 2006, Martin returned to Timor-Leste as a Special Envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Ian Martin was also Vice President of the International Center for Transitional Justice from 2002 to 2005. In August 2006, Ian Martin served as the Secretary General's personal representative in Nepal. Before that, he was the representative of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Nepal since May 2005. In 2009, he was appointed to head an independent United Nations Headquarters Board of Inquiry during the 2008 and 2009 Gaza War. In April 2011, Martin was named Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Post-Conflict Planning for Libya. Martin was the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Support Mission in Libya from 2011 until 2012. From 2015 to 2018, he was Executive Director of Security Council Report. And recently, he visited Timor-Leste in order to fulfill the invitation of the government of Timor-Leste as the special guest for the commemoration of 20th anniversary of Popular Consultation Day. Thank you very much for agreeing to be on the program. Perhaps we could start the conversation by sharing your history, your background. What brought you to the United Nations? Before I started doing anything for the United Nations, I was in the, the NGO sector. Uh, and in particular, I worked for Amnesty International for seven and a half years, first as the head of its Asia research department, which is when I first came close to some knowledge of the human rights situation in, in East Timor. Uh, and then I became its secretary general. So it was after I ceased being Secretary General of Amnesty that I began uh, working for the UN. 
initially in human rights jobs in Haiti and Rwanda, uh, and then that uh, led me to be asked to uh, come and set up UNIMED. What is the beauty of working as the uh, UN diplomat? Uh, I don't know about beauty, uh, it can be a very tough job um, and after I left Amnesty International for the UN, you know, people used to say to me, well, Amnesty International is a nice principled organization, it's independent, the UN is an organization of governments, uh, how do you find working for the UN? And my answer to that was always that uh, the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, these are the same principles that I thought I worked for in Amnesty International. It can be a little more difficult in the UN because it is after all an organization of governments but uh, the International Civil Service, those people who work for the, for the UN, should always be independent of any governments including their own and working for the, the principles of the United Nations Charter. Apart from the bright side of working as a, a UN an international diplomat, what are the, the downsides of working uh, with the UN? Um, well, it's a bureaucracy, of course, uh, and in part it's a bureaucracy because the governments that make up the, the United Nations insist on having very strict control of the way it uh, operates, financial control and other kind of controls. And of course, it's right that there should be strong financial controls, but sometimes that leads to excessive bureaucracy. Um, sometimes it makes it difficult for the United Nations to move as quickly as it should, although perhaps we'll come to how quickly we manage to move in the case of the East Timor popular consultation. Um, and of course, sometimes those governments are not genuinely committed to the principles of the United Nations Charter and they impose constraints on, on the way the UN works. So, People should always remember that United Nations is not just one thing, it's uh, now 193 governments, um, but it has extremely committed international civil servants working for it. And um, your tasks um, in the UN has involved um, being deployed in some places with very high security risks. Why do you still take those, uh, those jobs? Well, the United Nations isn't asked to work in places that are easy, certainly when we come to human rights missions and peace operations, which are the two kinds of uh, UN roles that I've played. They are almost by definition situations of conflict or post-conflict, and that carries security risks. Um, but it's important work. My own background, as I explained, is, is as a a human rights activist and if you want to have the opportunity to try to protect people's human rights you, you have to be willing to go and work in those kinds of circumstances. And as a human rights activist what do you see as the greatest challenges to, uh, to the protection, to protecting human rights of uh, people in the world? Uh, the answer to that is different in different circumstances. Um, uh, of course, it's repressive governments that are violators of human rights, but in the world today it's also very much uh, armed groups of different kinds, uh, extremist groups that are fighting against governments. So human rights are violated often today by both sides to a conflict or by many different parties. If we talk about some of the worst situations in the world today, like Syria, uh, you have many different groups that are involved in the violation of human rights, uh, certainly the, the government of, uh, of President Assad, but also the different groups that are fighting against that, that, that government. Uh, and it becomes increasingly difficult the more diverse are the groups that are involved in a conflict and in human rights violations. Uh, the harder becomes the work of the United Nations and others working to protect human rights. And where in the part of the world do you think that has the greatest challenge or obstacles to, to uh, the protection of human rights? There's no single answer to that question, but if we look at it by region today, certainly the situations in the Middle East, I've already referred to Syria, Yemen too is uh, the worst humanitarian disaster 
in, in the world. Um, uh, but then also some of the most difficult United Nations operations today are, are still in Africa, um, in Mali, in the Central African Republic, in South Sudan. Um, there's no one answer to, to where the most difficult contexts are. Uh, they're in, I'm afraid, a number of places today. Some do believe that one of the reasons for the deprivation of human rights is the fact that a number of countries, some countries are not very um, economically strong and some others are so much stronger. What do, what is your uh, view on that? Well, we should always remember that human rights include not only civil and political rights, you know, the rights not to be subject to political imprisonment, torture, extrajudicial executions, they also include economic, social and cultural rights um, uh, and very often it's those rights that are violated by countries that have a very high degree of economic inequality and are not concerned about the economic and social rights of their, of their citizens. So we must look at, at, at human rights as a whole. And just back to uh, your experience, your personal experience, um, the challenges, the risks, the pressure uh, in your job must be enormous. How do you overcome? How do you face those uh, challenges, risks, and also the pressure, obviously? Uh, well, I've always been fortunate to work with excellent colleagues inside the United Nations and from around the world, and one of the pleasures of working for the UN is working not just with people from your own country, but working with people from, from all regions. But also, one of the privileges of that work is to work with some of the best and most committed uh, people in the countries of, of concern, uh, human rights activists in those, those countries. So uh, uh, one is always remembering that the people who usually face the greatest risks are the activists fighting for human rights inside their own countries and the role of those of us who come from outside is to provide solidarity and protection when we can. Being an international diplomat, would you please share with us, the Timorese, um, your experiences in some of the countries that have gone through different or maybe similar or even the same experience to the Timorese, to what the Timorese have, have gone through? Well, first I should say it took me a long time to think of myself as a diplomat because uh, most diplomats are people who've worked for their governments and represented governments. I've never represented my government. Uh, I was a person from a non-governmental sector and an, an activist and a, a human rights uh, person uh, before I started working for the UN. And the first time I saw myself described in the media as a UN diplomat, I was a little surprised. By but now I've... I've become accustomed to being called a, a diplomat and I accept that if you serve the United Nations in a senior capacity you are a diplomat of, uh, of, of, of a kind. Um, every situation is very, very different. You know, I worked in Haiti, I worked in Rwanda, I worked in Eritrea and Ethiopia, I worked in Nepal, uh, I worked in Libya. Utterly different situations. And yet, I think in all of those situations, the principles of the United Nations are, are, are essential. Um, uh, and in particular, the principles of human rights, the principles of the Universal Declaration of, of, of Human Rights. Um, and it's the responsibility of, of uh, all parts of the United Nations system to be bound by those principles of the United Nations Charter. So even when my roles have been more political roles, I still regard myself as someone who is promoting the human rights principles of the, of the United Nations because political solutions and peace are, are necessary for the effective observance of, of human rights. But I was in Rwanda after the genocide, uh, one of the most extreme situations of, of my my lifetime uh, and my most recent UN service was in Libya, which today remains uh, torn by torn by conflict. Um, um, and the world, in some ways, has become uh, 
uh, more complex in dealing with those conflicts as well. The, uh, there isn't the cooperation amongst the, the, the big governments of the world at the United Nations that there, there was for a while. Uh, these days, uh, the, the leading members of the United Nations Security Council find it very difficult to agree with each other about uh, approaches you know, to the conflict in Syria, for example, or, 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 or Yemen. Um, and that makes the work of those working for the United Nations in those countries very difficult as, as well. So the lack of unity at the international level is, is really today a problem in those individual country situations. What are the common features of the conflicts throughout the whole world? Uh, what, what are the same uh, situations uh, in the conflicts that you have seen uh, yourself? Well, they're not the same. They are very different one from another. Um, they become more difficult when uh, external actors become involved in those conflicts. Uh, so if you look at Syria and even Libya, as I say, the last place I worked for the United Nations, it's difficult enough to get the different Libyan factions to agree with each other, but when they are supported by different regional and external actors, then the politics become even more complicated, and of course those are also the actors that, that arm them and encourage them in those, those conflicts. So, too often the external actors operate in a way that intensifies conflicts rather than helping to resolve conflicts. What do you think are the main factors that cause the conflicts? Um, do you see any specific factor that becomes a common cause for, for all the conflicts uh, in, in the world? Again, it's hard to generalize. Uh, the, the causes of different conflicts are different. Um, uh, sometimes they relate to problems of borders uh, and very often as a result of a colonial legacy and continued disputes of borders. Those in turn may be related to ethnic divisions, um, sometimes religious divisions as, as well. Um, so, so sometimes these are what we call identity conflicts uh, within uh, different, uh, different countries. Um, and unfortunately, there is an increasing tendency for that to become uh, extremism uh, and terrorism, so that one not only has uh, conventional wars or civil wars um, where the war is between armed combatants on, on each side, but the civilian population is not very much touched, uh, but increasingly the civilian population become victims and there are deliberate acts of, of, of terrorism. One of the things I respect very much about, uh, about Fallentil is that although it fought against the Indonesian occupation presence and, and targeted, of course, the Indonesian military, uh, it didn't target Indonesian civilians. Uh, it was conducting a, a, a military operation and it did not engage in, in mass violations of human rights. Um, uh, but too many armed groups these days, uh, uh, their tactics include the, the deliberate targeting of civilians and that makes the task of human rights protection much more difficult. There is also a belief that the more powerful countries could have had a greater role in helping to minimize the conflicts. Do you think that is the case? Certainly, uh, certainly it's the case. Um, um, and, and as I said, I think sometimes the large countries operate in ways that intensify conflicts rather than, rather than resolve them. You know, I gave my most recent experience in Libya as an example. It would be hard enough for the Libyans to reach agreement, but when they have different international influences, then it becomes even more difficult. Being a high official of the UN, do you think that could also be the same thing for the UN? A greater role in, in helping to maintain peace? Well, 
the UN is always available to help maintain peace, but it has to be, um, the opportunity has to be allowed by the country concerned or by the parties concerned, and it has to be supported by the governments of the United Nations, because the Secretary General of the UN himself can do only so much unless he's given the, the backing and the mandate uh, from the member states of the, of the United, United Nations. Um, so in all the situations we're talking about, the United Nations is, is willing to, to offer um, help towards political solutions, um, but it needs the support of member states. Fortunately, when the United Nations was involved in, in East Timor in, in 1999, there was very good support from, from member states, um, but that isn't always the case. The case of Timor-Leste has been perceived as one success story of the UN's involvement in resolving uh, conflicts. What do you think are the lessons to be learned by the rest of the world from Timor-Leste? I think one respect in which the leaders of Timor-Leste were very wise is that they saw the need for the support of the United Nations, even, even the United Nations as a transitional administration. Um, so although of course there were sometimes differences of opinion between the United Nations and the, the Timorese leadership uh, from 2000 onwards, in general, the relationship was a very constructive one. The relation, relationship between uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello and the, uh, and the, and the Timorese leadership. Um, so it does depend upon the willingness of national leadership to work effectively with the UN uh, and to provide a constructive framework for the country and the UN to, to work together. Uh, I think Timor-Leste has been a very good example of, of that. Although Timor-Leste has been quite successful, there were also times when the country sort of fell. Um, do you think a longer assistance from the UN would have helped prevent those situations? Take the example of 2006. Uh, do you think the UN's role would have been, have been uh, more helpful in preventing that? That's a question I've thought about and it's a hard question for me to answer because I wasn't here between 2002 and 2006 so I, I don't know uh, what views I would have had myself, how far I would have seen the crisis coming if I had been here on behalf of the United Nations, whether the United Nations could have done more than it did in that, in that period. Uh, uh, I, I can't really answer that, uh, that, that question. Um, uh, I came back in 2006 because once the crisis happened, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, saw the, the, wanted the UN to do as much as it could to help resolve it and I came as a special envoy in that, uh, in that spirit. Um, but uh, many people were taken by surprise by the, 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 the crisis of 2006 and it's Hard to know how it could have been better foreseen and better prevented. Hard to know. And the UN still has a mission in Timor at the moment. In your view, what would be the best role of, of that mission to, to help or to assist the Timor Leste's, uh, Timor -Leste's government? Well, since 2012, this has not been the place where there's been a United Nations peacekeeping presence. It's somewhere where the United Nations, what we call the agencies, funds and programs, have sustained support to, to Timor-Leste in, in many important ways and, and only, of course, at the, at the request of the, of the government. So today's challenges are the challenges of state building, of institution building, of development of different kinds, of education, of health, these are all fields in which the UN has specialised assistance uh, available. Human rights too, gender equality, and, and you know I'm seeing uh, the United Nations here today still very active in those those fields. Uh, so uh, 
I'm glad to glad to see that. To the future, what would you be able to say anything about how Timor Leste should proceed as a young nation in terms of democracy? Is there anything do you think from what you can see in the last few days that Timor Leste needs to do better uh, to to move forward as a nation? Well, of course, this is still a young country. This is 18 years since the assumption of full responsibility for, for governance. Um, uh, and it's important to continue to develop the institutions of a, of a democratic state, to make sure that parliament functions as a forum of dialogue and accountability, to make sure that the judicial sector is strong and independent uh, to make sure that the, the media uh, operates freely and in a way that can uh, uh, can also be a source of accountability to allow civil society to to flourish to, to still be concerned to look at the human rights problems that, that, that still exist uh, that, 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 that police fully respect human rights that in the private sphere, sexual violence, domestic violence is, uh, is, is overcome. There are a, a huge range of, of challenges. I'm not mentioning them, them all. Um, and these are all areas in which the UN can help and I, and I, I see it helping. Uh, but ultimately it depends upon the, uh, the political leadership and those in the government of the country, but also those who are active in civil society. What do you do these days, apart from UN? <laughs> for three years until last year, I was responsible for an organization that uh, reported on what goes on in the United Nations Security Council. It was not a, a United Nations organization, it was an independent organization, but it's the main source, it's called Security Council Report. Security Council Report, it's the main source of independent, transparent reporting on the Security Council. Um, but since I finished that job last year, I've gone back to my real home, which is London. Um, my own country is a mess. Um, its own democratic institutions are, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say, at a point of crisis, just at the, at the moment. I have my own strong views about that, and uh, as, a, as a citizen, I, uh, I, I will play my part, uh, but I remain, continue to remain engaged. I've uh, uh, done two small jobs for the United Nations short term this, this year, and I hope to remain active internationally as well as uh, engaged in my own country. If you ever had a chance to come back to, the, to Timor Leste, would you come back? Oh, of course, of course. No, I, I trust this won't be my last visit here. and. Uh, um, you know, because I've had an official role representing the Secretary General and because there have been a lot of official events, I, I, I haven't been able to travel as much just in a private capacity as I might like to. So perhaps I'll be able to come back and do some more of that. You certainly must have one or two things that you remember the most on your mission, uh, UNIMED mission. Would you be able to share those? There were many dramatic and emotional moments. Um, I remember in particular the day that I raised the United Nations flag at the UNIMET compound uh, in uh, Belly Day and uh, the enthusiasm with which the, the UN presence after 24 years was, was greeted here. Uh, but then I remember the, you know, the terrible days of the violence after the ballot uh, when not only were we experienced the risks ourselves, but we knew how bad was the situation of Timorese uh, around us. And, uh, um, and then of course I remember returning with, with Interfet and uh, going up to Dari for the first time uh, with a column of humanitarian assistance as those who'd been suffering in the, in the hills were able to be helped at, at last. So there are many different emotional reasons that, that I and my colleagues from UNIMET who've come back for this celebration have been remembering and sharing with each other and with our Timorese colleagues. Do you still keep in contact with those you worked with? Um... 
with, with many of them. I mean, we had some 1,000 international staff. I can't keep in touch with all of them individually. Uh, uh, and uh, by the time of the ballot, some 4,000 Timorese uh, staff. Um, but that mission led to some very close friendships because although it was, for a UN mission, it was a very short mission. It was th three months, really, May, June, July, all into all August. Um, uh, three to four months, uh, but it was so intense and people shared a lot of uh, experiences together and I think that's left the bonds that come from UNIMET uh, even stronger than in other United Nations missions. Do you still watch Timor-Leste uh, from a distance? A, a little bit, yes, sure, sure. I, uh, I, I, see quite a lot of peers that appears in the media. Um, uh, I'm only able to follow it in English, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, I'm limited by, by that. And uh, uh, I see um, Timorese representatives from time to time. In New York, I've always uh, been in contact with the representatives of Timor-Leste there and, and, and now in London too. Did you have a chance to meet some of the local staff? Uh, Oh, very much so. I mean, uh, uh, particularly we had a, a, a big reunion uh, at the United Nations House where we, where Shanana Gushmao uh, came and together with him we unveiled a, a memorial to the United Nations staff who have lost their lives here in, in Timor-Leste, including the UNAMET local staff who I've uh, referred to. Um, and there were many reunions there of people who hadn't seen each other. Uh, uh, I met some of my closest staff from, from, from that time. Uh, but through all the days, you know, even, even at lunchtime before I came to the interview for this program, uh, some more former UNIMET staff came and, uh, and found me. That's been, that's been wonderful. That was the first segment of the interview with the UN diplomat, Mr. Ian Martin. We'll be back after the following programs. Thank you very much for staying with us. You're still with me, Francis Suni on Diplomata. More on East Timor now. How was the decision to send you as a special envoy of the UN Secretary General made? Well, the 5th of May agreement between Portugal, Indonesia and the United Nations was reached thanks to very important diplomatic efforts by Secretary General Kofi Annan and others who worked for him, two of whom have been here uh, during this celebration, Mr. Frances Vendrell, Mr. Tamrat Samuel. They deserve huge credit for the negotiations that, that led to the popular consultation. But once the 5th of May agreement was reached, it was determined that there needed to be a United Nations mission to carry it out on the, the ground. Uh, I'd already worked for the UN in, in Haiti and Rwanda, and uh, I was then asked if I would take on the, the leadership of that, of that mission, and I, I very readily agreed. Um, compared to the previous places you had been working on, what was unique about uh, the situation in Timor-Leste at the time? Well, in Haiti and Rwanda, I was responsible for missions that were purely involved in human rights monitoring. In some ways, UNIMET was a human rights mission because it was here to deliver the, the right to self-determination, which comes within the UN human rights framework. But it was a much more political mission. It was an electoral mission because we were running an electoral process, the, the, the ballot. But it was also a, a political mission operating in extremely difficult security circumstances uh, with not only our electoral personnel, but we had political officers, uh, United Nations police, a small group of uh, military liaison officers. So my responsibility when I came as special representative of the Secretary General for the East Timor popular consultation was a, a broader political one, whereas my previous responsibilities have been specifically in the area of human rights monitoring. There was a perception, in, in some, to some degree, a belief that UNAMED was somehow pro-independence. How true is that? Well, 
that was never the case. Uh, the job of the United Nations was to ensure that the Timorese had the right to self-determination. What choice they made, that was a matter for the people of East Timor. It was equally acceptable to the United Nations if the people of East Timor had chosen to remain within, the, within Indonesia on the basis of autonomy and, and our job was to explain that option as well as the option of, of independence. Now, of course, uh, um, we found ourselves here, we recruited our, our national staff. Um, no doubt, the opinions among our national staff included a very high proportion of people who favoured independence because, as we now know, the overwhelming majority of the population of East Timor favoured independence. But we impressed on everyone that they must fulfil their responsibilities in an objective way and there was never any indication that any of our staff performed their duties in a way that was biased, whatever their personal opinions may have been. On a personal level, what was the biggest difficulty you had in the whole process of preparing the referendum for Timor-Leste at the time? It was certainly the security situation. I mean, the UN is very good at running elections or advising on elections, very professional. I, they sent excellent people. I didn't have to worry very much about the professionalism of the organization of registration and then the, the ballot, although of course it was part of my supervisory responsibility. My main concern was of course the security and the politics of, of security because as, as you know uh, it hadn't been possible to uh, ensure that there was an international security presence for the popular consultation. Indonesia insisted that it would remain responsible for security. The UN tried to get the best agreement it could um, for the withdrawal of the TNI to barracks in theory, although it never, never happened, uh, uh, as well as UN personnel to advise the Indonesian police. But that led to some very difficult decisions as to whether we should proceed with the process when Indonesia was clearly not in fact guaranteeing the security, but on the contrary there was a, the operation of the militia under the direction of the TNI to uh, intimidate, uh, to uh, um, prevent the independent side to encourage a pro-autonomy vote. So those are the most difficult decisions, when and how to go ahead in those circumstances and how to bring as much pressure to bear on Indonesia to contain the security situation. Was there any point where you felt that you, you, your own life might be at stake given the security situation at the time? I mean, all through the popular consultation, our international personnel were somewhat at, at risk. The highest risk, of course, came after the announcement of the, of the result. Um, again, the, the, the first people at risk were our Timorese staff, um, two of whom were killed as the, the ballot closed. Um, uh, but then when we were under siege in our compound, uh, certainly we were all at risk. We were very fortunate that no international staff were killed, but one American police officer was shot through the stomach as we evacuated our office in Nikisa. In Baokao, the international staff lay on the floor of the office while bullets went through the, uh, the, the office. Um, there were some very dangerous moments, um, uh, and we were indeed fortunate that, uh, that, that, that that no international staff were killed, 14 of our Timorese staff were, were killed around the country. Institutionally, what was the biggest, what were the biggest challenges facing UNAMED? I mean, after the ballot, they were how to, on the one hand, remain while international pressure mobilized for intervention, and on the other hand, how to get out safely our international personnel, our Timorese staff, and then eventually those Timorese who had joined us in the UN compound after they had been forced out of their homes that were being burnt around, around Dili. So those are the most difficult moments, but, but in the run-up to the popular consultation, they were the questions as to, as to how to try to check the, uh, the attacks that were taking place on, on the pro-independence side um, and try to get 
the Indonesians to fulfill the responsibility they had insisted upon to provide security for the ballot. Working with two different factions, with two different beliefs, as the highest level diplomat in the country, in, in, in Timor-Leste at that time, how did you manage all the politics, uh, given the, the pressure uh, the mission must have faced? Uh, how did you deal with, with the politics? Well, we certainly tried to deal fairly with both sides of the popular consultation. We negotiated what would be on the ballot paper. We negotiated a code of conduct. We tried to bring the uh, military uh, sides together as, as well. Um, uh, we, we brought together the, uh, the, the militia leaders, the Falun Tull leaders, the Indonesian military and police to make commitments that security would be maintained. Uh, at one point we brought uh, Tawamatan Ruak uh, from the cantonment in Waimori to our offices in Dili to meet with the Dandim, the Indonesian uh, TNI commander, we, we really tried to bring sides together and we had agreement in principle there was a, a meeting called Dari 2 in Jakarta where the uh, Timorese uh, pro-autonomy and pro-independence leaders met, Shanana Gushmao, Jose Ramos Horta, Mary Alcatiri were all at that, uh, at that meeting. They agreed to set up a body uh, again drawn from both sides that would meet immediately after the ballot and that whatever the outcome uh, there would be people would work together for a peaceful transition but I'm afraid those commitments were not fulfilled on the on the Indonesian side. Did any of the two parties ever try to convince or maybe pressure you to supporting their cause? No, um, I, you know, one of the features of the situation was that uh, I, the CNRT, led by Shanana, were always confident that there would be a vote for independence and therefore, although they weren't given fair opportunities to campaign, their view was they didn't even need to, to, to campaign. Of course, the, 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 the pro-independence students were very active going house to house. Um, it was the pro-autonomy side that was involved in coercive efforts, the, the misuse of the government machinery and government funds in the, in, in the campaign. Um, but uh, we, we tried to work fairly with both sides according to the code of conduct that they had agreed. Was there any point where you felt that there might be a risk of the referendum that happened? Oh, certainly, certainly, more than one point. Um, the first difficult decision was whether to proceed with the opening of registration of voters, um, because already the security situation is, was bad. Uh, but then the ballot itself, there were warnings that would be there would be violence. We thought there might even be violence on polling day, although polling day was relatively peaceful and the violence came afterwards. One of the, one of the um, situations at the time is that Shanana Guzman was, as the pro-independence leader, was working from a distance. Did you have difficulties communicating for, uh, with the pro-independence leadership, especially Shanana Guzman at the moment, uh, in terms of no, because we had a small office of UNAMET in Jakarta, which was headed by my colleague Tamrat Samuel, so he was in regular contact with uh, Shanana in his, in his prison house. The CNRT was strongly represented here. Uh, uh, Agio Pereira was one of the senior CRT representatives who was dealing with UNAMET over the details of the ballot. Uh, so in fact the communication was very good and, and I went on, on a few occasions to Jakarta and uh, met with uh, Shinana as well as being involved in meetings with President Habibi, General Ranto during the, the, the course of the popular consultation. So communication all round was, uh, was, was very strong. And how was, in your view, how was his leadership, uh, Shanar Guzman's leadership in the whole process of preparing for the referendum? 
his leadership was remarkable. Um, uh, uh, again, I think, I mean, firstly, he was always determined that the ballot should go ahead. Um, we knew that the security was not being provided as the Indonesians had committed. We knew great risks were being run. If he had said, don't proceed, the United Nations certainly wouldn't have proceeded. But we all knew that there was a, a window of opportunity that might close. So despite the risks, he always insisted that the ballot should, should go ahead. And then in the days after the ballot, I think the, the, the most remarkable feature was the restraint of, of Valentil, who saw their people being, being killed and displaced, who you know, thought they ought to try to use their armed opportunity to defend their people. Uh, and yet Shanana, and I'm, I'm sure you know the story of uh, emotional conversations by telephone between him and uh, Tawamatan Ruak, uh, but insisting that they must remain in the cantonments uh, and await international intervention and not lead to a situation of violence uh, on the part of the independence side that would have would have served the Indonesian narrative that the problem was a conflict amongst the East Timorese rather than a conflict between the TNI and their militia and, uh, and Timorese. On the other hand, what was, how was the, leadership, the Indonesian leadership like uh, at the time when you, uh, with the team, prepared for the referendum? I think the Indonesian leadership was much more confused. Um, it was always very hard to to know exactly um, what Indonesian policy was in relation to the security situation. Um, uh, a lot of my dealings were with uh, Foreign Minister Alatas uh, and his representative uh, from the Foreign Ministry on the ground here. Uh, but on the other hand, the control of the Habibi government of the TNI um, through General Waranto, but even more on the ground here, that was, that was uncertain. So we were talking with many different parts of the, uh, the Indonesian responsibility um, to, to try to ensure that the Indonesian government's commitment to provide a fair ballot in circumstances of security was fulfilled. When the referendum took place, uh, there was an accusation that not all the ballot paper were counted and that was because UNAMED was, again, pro-independence. How true is that? Oh, it's complete nonsense. Um, and, I mean, you know, immediately after the ballot, there were complaints that it hadn't been fair put from the pro-autonomy side. We had an independent electoral commission because UNAMED was running the election, UNAMET, so to speak, was the electoral authority. There was an independent commission of three very senior electoral experts who were monitoring our performance as UNAMET. And they held a hearing uh, at which the pro on economy side presented their complaints and they very quickly came to the conclusion that the ballot had been completely fair. And it was very heavily observed. There were, there were observers from around the world uh, was heavily scrutinized and none of those observers reported any irregularities in the conduct of the, of the ballot. Soon after the referendum was over, violence started. What do you think brought the UN to the decision to pull out the international staff from Timor-Leste? Well, that's a very complicated issue because it happened in a number of stages. Some of our staff were always going to leave because the electoral officers had done their, their job. So they, they left early on and some when the count was completed. But then we faced the, the, the question of the security of the staff who remained and the security of our Timorese staff who were with us in the UNIMET compound and then the security of the people who'd been displaced from their homes in Dili who had come over the wall and joined us in the, the compound. And that required a very difficult negotiation with United Nations headquarters, 
with Australia because it was Australia that had to both fly people out but also agree to admit them to, to Darwin um, uh, and with the Indonesian authorities because they had to cooperate in the departure of people and they still of course regarded the Timorese as Indonesian citizens so we had to get the agreement of everyone to be able to get people to, to safety um, and so people left in stages but 80 of us remained with the people who'd been displaced. We sent out many of our international staff and all our local staff, but at that point 80 of us remained with the displaced people in the compound until two things, until President Habibi had agreed to invite an international security force um, on the 12th of September, what became Interfet, um, and until we could get agreement to take all the Timorese from the compound out to Darwin with us. Um, but by then, although we left for a short period, I then came back with, with Interfet, a small UNIMET team actually remained throughout here, um, but UNIMET was no longer the international presence that was necessary. It needed an armed security force, and we only left once the decision had been taken to, to send that force. The departure of the international staff, uh, the UN, was somehow seen as a betrayal to the Timorese uh, strong trust in the UN. Uh, people, the Timorese, were feeling that they had been abandoned. Uh, how did you feel about leaving the country in that situation where people almost had no hope of survival. I, I mean, I, our staff, felt terrible. We had said the UN would stay, whatever the outcome of the, of the ballot. Uh, but immediately, you know, UNIMET was chased out of the different uh, district uh, headquarters and the security situation became an impossible one for an unarmed, an unarmed mission. Um, so, I, I must say, I haven't heard anybody use the word betrayal today. On, on the contrary, uh, personnel of UNIMED have been welcomed back uh, with, uh, uh, with great warmth. Um, but the point I would stress is that in the end, we left only when there had been a decision by Habibi, by the UN Security Council, by the Australians to lead in Interfet. And by then, that was what was necessary in this situation not the unarmed mission that, uh, that was UNIMET. Do you think the result of the referendum and the consequences, the, the events that followed after the referendum could have been prevented in any way? I don't see how, I must admit. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, the UN should only have carried out the ballot with an international security force. And of course, that would have been desirable. But I agree with those people who say that Habibi could never have, have, never have got the agreement of the, of the TNI and other nationalists in Indonesia. I, I, I don't think if the, if the UN and others had tried to insist in May of 1999 that there must be uh, an, an armed peacekeeping force in East Timor at that time, I don't think there would ever have been a 5th of May agreement and I don't think there would ever have been a ballot and a popular consultation. Now then, we made many efforts, and I've described some of them, to try to head off the violence. Um, but even in retrospect, I don't know what more, we, what more could have been done. It has been 20 years since you left um, East Timor. Now you're back. What do you see in Timor today? Well, I see something very different from what I saw in 1999, both before and in the destruction after the, the ballot. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to see uh, places that have been rebuilt. I haven't been able to travel very much in the country, but I've traveled a little to Maliana, Bobonaro, Balibo, Rakusi, and, and seen some of the, uh, uh, the, the reconstruction. The most important thing is, is peace. I came back again in the crisis of, of 2006 
uh, when again I saw houses burning in, uh, in Dili. Um, but I think that uh, the lesson of that time was that whatever political differences there are, Timor-Leste mustn't be allowed to slip into, into violence uh, again. And that gives the opportunity for, for, for rebuilding. Um, and I hope that the, the, the spirit of 1999 that has been recalled during this commemoration is also the spirit in which uh, Timor-Leste will go forward because it's, it's important to remember where Timor-Leste has come from and to make sure that that's understood by a, a younger generation that wasn't uh, conscious in 1999. Um, but it's more important that that spirit is harnessed for the, for the future of the country. You had the chance to meet a number of Timorese leaders uh, in, the, in the last few days. What have you discussed with those various leaders that you met? <laughs> well, of course, a lot of reminiscences about how we knew our, each other in different situations. Uh, as I said, I, I first met Shinanu Gushnau in his prison house and his first words to me were, We've been waiting for the United Nations for 24 years. I, I first met Tawa Matan Ruak when I took the UN helicopter to visit him in the Falintil Cantonment in Waimori. I, I first met uh, Mary Al Katiri at the Dare 2 conference in Jakarta, where Jose Ramos Horta was present as, as, as well. So we've been remembering those times, and, and I respect very much the different contribution that was made by, by those, those leaders in, in different ways. Those who fought inside the country, those who carried out the diplomatic uh, struggle and pressure outside the, the country. Um, uh, and I, I hope that they will, will work together in, in carrying forward the, the further building of this country. And finally, if you ever had a message to tell the leaders of Timor and also its people, what would it be? It would be that you achieved the independence, self-determination and independence by working together, by a united, uh, a united struggle. Um, uh, and that succeeded despite political differences. Um, uh, um, and again, it's important that, that, that even when political differences continue, they don't stop people from working together in the greater good of the country. My 60-minute conversation with Mr. Ian Martin has given us a lot of information about his work and experience in helping the then Timor Timur to become what we call today Republica Democratica de Timor-Leste. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the program and I'll see you on the next episode of Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. Bye for now.